Hi, everybody. Welcome to um, the RSI Encore presentations. Really excited to have you guys all here today. Um, we're just going to present 10 of the outstanding, many outstanding presentations we've heard in the past two days, um, summarize about five weeks of really, really hard work. Everyone's done an amazing job. Um, and we just think that these 10 are a good sort of sampler platter of um, everything we've seen at RSI this year. So anyway, we're, um, like I said, really excited to have you all here. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to do the first six presentations. We're going to take about a 15-minute break, um, meet back here, and then we'll do the last four. And um, yeah, so students, this is just a reminder that when you're giving your presentations, when you're taking questions, make sure you repeat the question after you hear it. It's a big room. We want everybody to be able to hear. Um, Anyway, without further ado, I guess I will present our first presentation by M. Ray Onal, who's going to tell us about the effects of intraswarm grouping on the maneuverability of a robotic swarm. Thanks, M. Ray. Honorable judges, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. So I'm sure many of you know the literal definition of the term swarm, which is a dense group of flying insects. However, in the, term, in the context of our research, the term swarm applies to any group of individuals that exhibits swarm behavior. This can apply to flocking in birds, schooling in fish, or herding in tetrapods, like cows. So swarms exist in nature, but why are they there? What are their benefits? Swarming enables the groups of animals to take advantage of collective intelligence, which is the intelligence that arises from the collaboration between members of a group. The uh, collective intelligence enables animals to do path planning, nest construction, migration, and have increased predator awareness. One example of collective intelligence that I find particularly interesting is the path planning of ants. What they do is they use something called stigmergy, which is a method of communication through the alteration of one's environment. So let's say an ant's returning from a nearby food source to its nest. It, the nearer the food source is, the more concentration of pheromones it would leave behind on its trail. Hence, the remaining ants all have to follow the path with the highest pheromones to lead to the nearest food source. So what is a swarm in robotics? What does that mean? A robotic swarm is a collection of simple individual robots that collectively can accomplish uh, complicated tasks. One important thing to note, again, is that a swarm does not necessarily have to be flying, although this one is. Um, those are robots, by the way. Um, another key feature to note about a robotic swarm is that the communication between the members of a swarm is entirely and utterly local. That means all of the members only interact locally with each other and do not have an, entire, an idea of what the mission of the swarm is as a global entity. Um, these robotic swarms come with a few advantages. First of all, they're simple. The materials to, come to build those individual robots are simple, easy to acquire, off-the-shelf materials. Their um, swarms are also better at spatially distributed tasks than a conventional um, single robot system. They're scalable, meaning that we can increase and decrease their size as we wish, and they're robust to the failure of one of the robots. So if one of the robots breaks down, that's fine. There's 100 more to replace it. What are the applications of swarm robotics in the real world? So NASA has been looking into space exploration using swarm robotics, since, as I said, uh, swarm robots are better at, uh, at spatially distributed tasks. So one such example of a project that's currently being under undertaken is um, Mars exploration using robotic swarms. Other applications include environmental monitoring, search and rescue missions, and reaching locations inaccessible by humans, like deep underground caves. Seen as the robot, swarm robots have such great applications in the real world, there's been a lot of research in swarm robotics. There's been uh, research in modeling the spatial behavior of animal swarms to later replicate them in robotic swarms, in animal swarms, in robotic swarms. There's been research in communication between swarm members, which I would like to stress once again is entirely local. Um, there's been also research directed at reducing the number of informed members in a swarm which is the number of members that are equipped with expensive, relatively expensive sensory equipment because the swarm needs to see somehow. And that, that relative to the price of the small individual simple drone is very expensive. So reducing that would minimize cost. And finally, there's been uh, research in coordinated exploration using robotic swarms using something called the BAT algorithm, which is essentially a global optimization algorithm which was inspired by the echolocation behavior of micro bats. 
So for the purpose of our experiment, we wanted a human-controlled swarm. And human-controlled swarms come with certain benefits. First of all, the human operator can recognize and mitigate weaknesses that they see in the swarm as they're controlling it. They can better respond to unfamiliar scenarios. They might have access to outside information that the swarm might not have access to. We can, uh, they can accommodate changes in intent of the swarm in real time, whereas a pre-programmed swarm might not be able to. So for our experiment, we wanted to make a 2D swarm simulation. So for that, in order to do that, we needed to address the question, how does a swarm move? There are two main control schemes for controlling a swarm. The first is lockstep and the second is leader. In lockstep, all of the robots are oriented in the same direction and respond simultaneously to the same command by the operator. In leader control scheme, the operator directly controls the leader, the red alpha mouser that we can see, and the rest of the fo uh, robots follow. So this is an example of what our experiment looked like. This is one of the levels. We made a 2D swarm simulation um, using Unity with C Sharp. Um, we, were, we prompted the subjects to maneuver the swarm through the maze. As we can see here, that's what we defined to be a maze. We had 18 randomly generated mazes for each subject, and we had five small gaps and five large gaps in each maze. We can see that this is an example of a large gap, and that's an example of a small gap. The small gaps and large gaps were discrete in size, meaning that they did not vary and were constant. Um, we measured for each gap three variables. Firstly, the number of collisions, the collisions between the robots and the barriers. And then we measured the time taken for the entire swarm to pass through one of the, uh, one of the gaps. We also, did, uh, we also recorded the gap size, so small or large, once again, discrete values. We ran our experiment under three conditions, two groups, three groups, and four groups. We can see each, each group in the bottom of the slide. Each swarm contained 13 robots, 12 followers, and one alpha. And each uh, experiment, each condition had one practice trial, one practice level, and five experimental levels. We decided to randomize the order that the conditions appeared to the subjects because inevitably the subjects would improve over time at conducting the swarm over many trials. So we decided to randomize that in order to prevent biased results. So, oh yeah, I need to. So this is a video of, an, of one of our levels. That's not playing, it's playing on the screen. Don't worry, we're not timing you for this part. Okay, thank you. So I, um, as you can see, this is an example of a three group swarm going through one of our mazes. And I would like you to pay attention to these white robots here. Notice how one of them gets stuck behind and takes longer to pass through the gap. This is an example of how we record the time taken. So that's the difference between a longer time on a gap and a smaller time on a gap. So how long it takes for it to come depends on whether robots got stuck or not. So here are our results. Firstly, we can see the time taken for each subject and the number of collisions for each subject. The average time taken is roughly 3.5 seconds, which when compared with a theoretical minimum time of crossing a gap of 1.1 seconds, we can see that subjects were 3.2 times slower than the theoretical minimum time. We can also see that the average collisions was roughly six. And when considering that there were 13 robots, this seems like a lot, because this is per gap. But the small, gap, uh, the small gaps were actually very hard to get through. So uh, it's actually harder than it looks. So these are our first results. We can see that the small gap collisions have a lot more, small gaps have a lot more collisions than the large gaps. And we tested this was an ANOVA test, and it's statistically, signif statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.001. So small gaps have more collisions than large gaps. This was expected. Moving on to more interesting results, we, we graphed the collisions per group number through small gaps and the collisions per group number for the large gaps. And we can see in the large gap there's not, mu not much variation between the groups. And this is most likely due to the fact that the large gaps are very easy to go through without having any collisions whatsoever. So there wasn't much difference. However, for the small gaps, we can see, interestingly, that the four group swarm had much less uh, collisions than the two and three group swarm. So this, was, this difference was tested, again, with an ANOVA test. And it turned out to be statistically significant with a p-value of 0.01. One possible explanation of this was the fact that the, that the four group swarms tended to elongate 
as the alpha went faster and faster. And the three group swarms uh, displayed this behavior to a lesser extent, and the two group swarms did not display this behavior at all. This explains the difference in number of collisions. So we also graphed the average times. So the average time through small gaps and average time through large gaps. We can see that the average time through small gaps is slightly longer, actually. And we tested this difference again. And statistically, it is significant with a p-value of 0.005. One possible explanation of this is that the small gaps were harder to get through, and as we saw in the video previously, they, they had robots stuck behind and longer times. So um, here we have the time taken for each group number through small gaps and large gaps, and we can see that the four group swarms take slightly longer in both cases. This actually was tested again with a statistics test, and we got, an, uh, we got that it was statistically insignificant. We got a p-value of 0.113. So one possible explanation of this, once again, is the elongation of the four-group swarm, in that a longer swarm would take longer to get through one of the gaps. So in conclusion, the swarms of two and three groups did not have any statistical differences in um, collisions or time taken. However, for the swarm of four groups, surprisingly, had many fewer collisions and was slightly slower. So we could say, that the, choosing the four group swarm is a trade off between speed and accuracy. So what does this mean for real world, world applications? So for real world, world applications, we, I think the four, I would recommend that the four group swarm be chosen because although, yes, it might be slightly slower than the three group and two group swarms, the time sacrificed is a small price to pay for the extra accuracy that comes with it. You would much rather spend a fraction of a second passing through obstacles than lose half your robots colliding with them. So for future work, we could obtain data on the path traveled by the swarm through our, one of our levels. We could use that data to compare with the optimal path for minimizing collisions in time. We could use that data to develop collision avoidance and then understand when and why human-controlled swarms stray from the optimal path. This could be some sort of cruise control for swarms, just like in cars. We can investigate different grouping patterns. This means the number of swarms, uh, the number of groups in the swarms. We, in our experiment, we did two, three, and four groups, and it turned out interestingly that two and three were similar and four was not. So we could investigate five, six swarms, see maybe they have less collisions, less time. We, that's interesting to investigate. We could also investigate the idea, the possibility of swarm subgroups, which is forming subgroups within the groups of the swarms. So I would like to acknowledge Dr. Don Wendell and Dr. Matthew Kane for accommodating me into their lab and giving me such a memorable summer. Dr. Jenny Sendova for helping me uh, practice for this presentation and just providing me the support throughout the entire of RSI. I would like to thank Semantic Pyra for going through my paper with me and William Ellsworth, Jonathan Coe, and Eloy Fernandez for helping me with coding. And I would like to thank MIT CE and RSI and my sponsors for making this experience possible. Thank you. All right, so we'll take a few questions now. Um, we're going to try to keep it um, relatively short, but they're not going to be timed. As a reminder, please repeat the question. And I also wanted to mention, I forgot to mention at the beginning, but yes, his, um, his mentors were Dr. Matthew Kane and Dr. Don Wendell. So let's have a short round of applause for them, too. All right, are there any questions? Yes. So I feel like in order to interpret your result, I need to know more about the rules and information within groups and between groups. In other words, in the limit, you could say all you did was color them differently and they're all just behaving independently. But what, was there something, what, what defined a group in terms of their behavior with respect to other members of the same color versus mm -hmm. other members of different color? So the question was, how do the groups interact with each other and how do they work, if I'm understanding it correctly? So basically, the way they worked, I did not just color them differently. I, um, I had this algorithm that I made with uh, repulsion. So each different colored group repelled each other and um, they attracted each other more. We used this algorithm that um, we found online uh, for swarm. For It's this attraction repulsion algorithm for um, keeping a swarm and swarm formation. And I augmented that with uh, different number of groups. And I changed it to um, follow the leader in a different way. So yeah, they act differently 
like within the group versus intergroup. Yes. Can you say something about the computational complexity of this? And if you were to scale it up, would you have to change your implementation? So the question was about the computational complexity. Um, it was actually all relatively fast. I don't know any specifics on it, but uh, I don't think we would have to scale it. Uh, I mean, if we scaled it up, we might have to find a faster way of detecting the, because it has collision avoidance when the swarm is stopping. We might have to find a faster way of um, implementing that, but for the purposes of this experiment, we didn't have much problems with that. Um, yes. So this is an example of a human controlled swarm that can accommodate changes. So is there, was there, uh, were you the one that were controlling the leader in each of these uh, simulations or was the leader on, a, on a sort of an auto uh, find as well? Uh, right. The question was, were we controlling the leader um, directly or was it on its some sort of cruise control on its own? So um, I, well, the way we did it was we controlled the leader directly because we wanted to see how a directly human controlled swarm. But um, in the future, we would want to implement some sort of automatic help that would help the user control it and have less collisions and all that. But we don't have that in this version. Other questions? Yes. So you had talked about the fact that one of the expenses that comes into building these robots is putting in the sensors to actually see what's going on. Are you imagining that each group is effectively headed by a sensor, uh, an augmented robot, and the supporting colors, supporting other that color would be simpler robots? Is that where, where some of the trade-offs with having more groups come in as well? Right. Um, the question was where would exactly would the sensors go? On, uh, with respect to the groups. Um, that is a question that we haven't looked into because we uh, only made a virtual simulation and we never actually had them um, have to see. We used a collision avoidance um, called a raycast in Unity, but that um, we didn't check like if we would need sensory equipment for that or not. All right. Um, we'll take one more question, and then you guys will have a chance to talk with them at break. Yes, in the back. I know you've been raising your hand a long time. Sorry. <laughs> so my question is, uh, how did you define the, the optimal path? Like, did you give the ratio of, of time for a uh, multi How did you do that? So uh, the question was, how would you define the optimal path? Um, all right. OK. So the, the time would be the difference between the first robot and the last robot. So the optimal time would be if they didn't have much separation between them to begin with when passing the gap, which is actually something that I think we should change, and we should change it to just the followers speed. But the way we implemented it in this project was first low robot to last robot, including the, the, the alpha. So um, I mean, I guess if we were to stick with the first robot to last robot, the minimum time pass would be just getting through it without having any of the robots stuck behind. And since the speed is set, it would have to be the minimum time. All right, thank you, Emre.